In keeping with our singleness of purpose and our third tradition, we ask out of respect for our speaker to please remain seated until she has finished. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker for the evening, Allison. Hi, I'm Allison Adams. I am an alcoholic. Did y'all bring in the chirping? I, I play that on Alexa every morning for my 11th step because we don't have those in the desert. Um, uh, my name is Allison Adams. I am an alcoholic. I'm very glad to be here, even gladder to be sober. And uh, I drove up from Surprise. And um, thanks, Maureen, for joining me. She made the extra trip from Gilbert to hang out with me tonight. Thank you for the cooler weather. I really appreciate it. And I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, to uh, attribute my being here to Oscar. I don't know if that's true or not, but I'm assuming that it is. My dear friend Oscar, I'm sure you all know him. Um, Oscar and I were in the same home group back in Los Angeles. And, and actually, Lexi was there as well, come to find out. And um, I met Oscar back right before he uh, got deployed to Kosovo, I think, back in 95. Was it 95? And um, I, I'm just, I love AA. This is my first live meeting where I'm actually in a building in a, in a while. I went to a meeting in a parking lot a couple weeks ago, um, but that was it. And so it's so good to see your bright, shiny faces, and um, I hope that you're excited to be sober as well. I, uh, I love AA. I love my sobriety. I'm in a place right now in my life where I'm just... I feel like I've recommitted to my sobriety and how am I really showing up in Alcoholics Anonymous? You know, we get a lot of tools when we come to AA. And at varying times in my own sobriety, um, I've been sober since September 25th of 19, September 26th of 1992. And I've had parts of my sobriety where you were not that important to me. You know, I was much more important of getting what I wanted out there. And I almost lost my sobriety over it, I believe, but I don't know for sure because I didn't. But, um, but I'm in that place where it's, I, I, I have a, such a commitment to the way I live in AA, the fact that I still have an opportunity to be happy, joyous, and free at even a greater level than I know. I know that there's always more to learn, there's more to do here, and uh, I'm super on fire about it, and I hope you are too, and I uh, hope my talk helps somebody tonight. But I'm going to start a little bit with about where my life is right now, um, because it's been a rough year. And maybe it has been for a lot of you as well. <laughs> but uh, I, uh, last, last September, after connecting with um, the man that I had always loved, uh, we had known each other for 31 years. We drank together, dated, got sober at the same time, interacted in each other's lives, although we went to different AA meetings. And um, we reconnected last year, and I thought we were finally going to get to have our chance. But we, he was found dead in his apartment in New York City last September 10th. He had died on the 8th and he was found on the 10th. And uh, he had lost his way from AA. You know, he was a theater actor, he traveled the country, he didn't have the foundation and the stability and the commitment and he just, um, you know, when, when I hear chapter 5 now, it has a different kind of meaning for me today because uh, chapter 5, paragraph 1, you know, rarely have we seen a person fail that has thoroughly followed our path. And I, I know today what active alcoholism looks like in someone that has had a lot of time in sobriety and has uh, veered off the course, you know. They went that one degree off the plum and stayed that way until they got so far away that they just couldn't bring themselves back. And um, on Feb February 21st of this year, my ex-husband and my kid's father died of this disease. And so that was a few months ago. The last time I wore this dress was four weeks ago at his memorial service. And um, he, too, he, he started drinking again after 17 years of sobriety. And, and uh, Oscar knew him pretty well, too. And the day after he, uh, he passed away, Oscar called me that morning. I think it was like 7 o'clock in the morning. We were on the phone for an hour and a half and just talking about the impact he had in our lives. And uh, so there's been a lot of sadness and a lot of heaviness in my life. And... But you know what's really awesome is that AA works, and I know and have never wavered from the idea that AA is, gives me the access to the power that I need in my life when times get bad, because we don't get a choice on whether times are going to get bad or, not, bad or not, and this whole quarantine thing has had me pulling my hair out of my head. I hated it. Um, and 
But AA works, and I know that AA will carry me through anything, and it's also uh, given me the opportunity to pay attention to the things that are happening in my life and to the people around me so that I can learn from those experiences. And so today I get to be a single mom to my teenage boys and try to help them through this. They're doing remarkably well. And we're just going to move on, you know, and I'm going to keep working with people in Alcoholics Anonymous. I'm going to stay committed even more so, hopefully. But uh, I, I love my life, and I think I'm a very blessed and fortunate person. And... Um, Years ago, I don't know what year it was, Oscar, when Vincio died, but uh, I remember when he died, and I went to his memorial service, and I was so sad at that service, and I started, I started tearing up at that service, and I thought to myself, it occurred to me that if it were not for my sobriety and Alcoholics Anonymous, I never could have experienced the sense of loss I had from losing somebody in my life, because I, and the only reason I could feel that pain is because I knew what the great love for those people were that I lost. And I would never give up the ability to love other people at the risk of also losing them. So, and on that happy note, let's move on. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't know, it started getting heavy in here and I was starting to get bored of it, so I'm like, let's go. Um, so I started drink when I was 15 years old. I grew up in this little farm town outside of Houston, Texas called Alvin heavens to Betsy. I always thought it was country music that was my problem. And uh, I was a bit, you know, I was rebellious from a young age. I have a couple sisters and a brother. We were always fighting with each other. We started family therapy when we were young. We thought each other was the problem. That had nothing to do with it. We all suffered from the ism one way or the other. And I did not know that what I was suffering from was a spiritual illness. I had a broken spirit. I had to learn about that when I got to Alcoholics Anonymous. But I knew that I was a kid that was irritable, restless, and discontent. I was incredibly acutely aware of myself. You call it self-centered. I just knew that there was always something wrong with me. My voice was too low. I had this stupid name called Allison. I wish my parents called me Mary. You know, uh, you know the, uh, the cool kids went to the Catholic Church. I was a Methodist. There was something. I didn't understand why I felt different. There was a sense of separation between me and the rest of the people of the world as far back as I can remember. And when I was 15 years old and I got to get my first drunk, I did not know that alcohol was going to be the cure for all of that dishevelment, that separation, the fact that I didn't feel like I fit in, like I belonged or I was a part of anything else. And alcohol actually did that for me. It was, let's see, May 1980, May 29th of 1980, I was 15 years old, 55 today. So I was 15 years old, and I don't know about you, but I sit there and add that crap up. So um, it was at the end of my freshman year in high school, and I went to a party at my best friend's house. She uh, was uh, the daughter of the Presbyterian minister in town in Alvin, Texas, and they were out of town that night. We had a big party, and I got a couple of the guys to get me a bottle of Strawberry Hill, and I wanted to get drunk because, see, my older sister started drinking before I did. My older sister, Kirsten, she's a year older than me, more athletic, uh, more popular, more outgoing, and I wanted to be popular. I wanted to be outgoing, and she spoke to boys. I wanted to talk to boys. I didn't know how to do that, and so I planned this drunk, and... Um, I got drunk that night on May 29th, and I actually felt the m magic of alcohol. You know, I felt the effect produced that made me feel the power that was missing in my life that I did not know was missing. And it was the effect produced on May 29th of 1980 that I sought for the next 12 years until I found you guys. And most of the time I was able to hit that effect produced. I was able to feel the power of alcohol in my life. But the closer I got to meeting up with y'all, the less and less often I could uh, depend on alcohol to provide me with that sense of power, with that sense of ease and comfort as the book describes. And it became kind of a hit and miss scenario. And the fact that I could no longer uh, rely on alcohol when I got to you guys drove a level of desperation in me that it was time to take some different action. But let me tell you a little bit about what it was like while I was out there. Um, I grew up in Alvin, Texas when I was uh, 17, 18 years old. Well, when I was 16, let me back it up. I fell in love with heavy metal music. I saw, I was in the grocery store one day and I saw this guy on a music magazine and I thought, I am in love. I thought his name was Eddie Van Halen. It actually was David Lee Roth. And I was... That was my goal in life right there. And uh, so I applied. I started going to concerts. Um, I started doing shows. I started going down to the beach with a bunch of surf rats and 
uh, we're partying on the beach, popping pills at the beach, drinking a lot of booze at the beach, just up to no good. I, I managed to graduate high school, but I was skipping classes all the time. You know, we could, uh, I would go to lunch and I would end up smoking stuff and not coming back to class. But I made it through high school and I started going to bars. Back then the drinking age was 19 in Texas. And I would go up into the city of Houston about 30 miles away and I could get into bars when I was 16, 17 years old. And I loved going to the nightclubs. Um, I loved the punk music that was going on at that time. And I was, I just was really into having a good time. I loved how alcohol was working in my life. I started hanging around with other bar rats. I was hanging out with men that were much too old for me. I was uh, taking actions and, and, and agreeing to doing things that I shouldn't have been doing at that age. Um, but I didn't care. Alcohol was working for me. And at the age of 18, when I finally graduated high school, I wanted to come out, wanted to go to LA. And I applied to the Fashion Institute of Design and Merchandising out there. I thought I wanted to go into to fashion merchandising. But I got to LA and found out that I didn't really want to do that because it got in the way of my drinking and other things, if you know what I mean. Uh, for any of you that know LA, I was living right outside of MacArthur Park on Wilshire Boulevard and Rampart. Not the best part of the city. It's not where you like take the tour of the stars part of Los Angeles. But I lived right outside of downtown and I lasted in, I think I lasted in school maybe a semester and a half. Felt my first, first earthquake in a high rise in Los Angeles back in 1983. And um, really, I was about bar crawling, going into the bars, looking for him, chasing musicians all over Kingdom Come, ending up on tour buses doing you know what. And, uh, <laughs> and just having a great time. You know, um, I thought my life was fun. I thought it was exciting. I thought that if you only knew who I knew, not that I had, was getting any respect from anybody, but I was just, you know, I was, I was, um, you know, I was a drunk chick looking for a good time, you know. And, um, it, and, and things didn't go well out there. After a couple of years, I went back to Texas for a little while. That didn't go well. I got involved with some guys that, I, that were pretty violent with me, and I went back to L.A. And, you know, I just kept going. I kept showing up where I was. You know, I, I refuse to take responsibility of myself, and I don't know about you, I'm 27 years sober. That's still something I deal with today is taking full responsibility for my own actions. Um, I do not like to be held accountable, and I have to admit at 27 years sober, it's still true. But I'm certainly better than I've ever been. And um, we, have a, we have a solution for that. It's called Alcoholics Anonymous. And um, I, I, the end of my drinking, I'm living in West LA, I'm living with other people that party like I do. My roommate, my roommate was a transplant from uh, Long Island, New York. She was dating a friend of mine. She had moved out because they had met while he was in New York. And we became roommates. And she did pretty well financially. She was in a career that made her a lot of money. And so I asked her if there was any opportunity that I could go and work for the company that she worked for. And she set up an a interview for me. So I went into the Hollywood Tropicana female mud wrestling bar. And I applied for a position. <laughs> I was not a mud wrestler. She was a mud wrestler, foxy boxer. I was a cocktail waitress because I did not have the courage to put on a swimsuit and wrestle you in foam. She's making two grand a night, and I was making about 400 a night, but I was trading it all in so that I could zoom around the bar and work faster, if you know what I'm saying. <laughs> Drinking a lot of tequila. Uh, I would always end up over in the valley at night, the San Fernando Valley, like how in the hell did that happen? And I would have to find my way back the next day in last night's pantyhose and makeup and cigarette smoke and super aquanet mega hold hairspray hair and just disgusting. And that was the, that was the last year of my drinking. Um, my father had passed away. My father, and my parents had gotten divorced. My father had remarried. And in February of 1992, after three years of being sick from Lou Gehrig's disease, my father died on, on Valentine's Day. And uh, I was a terrible daughter to him when he was sick. I found his illness to be embarrassing. If you've ever had to be with someone toward the end of their life while their body's not cooperating, and uh, I did not know how to help my father and take care of him. When I would go to Texas, I got angry at him. I got bitter at him. I continued to take his checks and spend his money, and I... Um, was resentful that he put me in a position that I had to feel uncomfortable being around his illness. He would fall down in parking lots, his hands would clamp up on silverware so he couldn't feed himself and it was very painful. And uh, I just, I had no ability to have the empathy for another human being in my advanced stage of alcoholism. And so by the time my father died on uh, Valentine's Day of 1992, I had just canceled a trip back to Texas to visit him because I wanted to cash in the money so I could drink some, some more. 
And uh, I had felt guilt for that for a long time until I got to do an inventory over it. But um, I was a terrible daughter then, and for the rest of that year, for most of that year, I was drinking and partying at the beach. I worked on the Santa Monica Pier as a bartender. I got fired after my father's funeral from the Hollywood Tropicana, and uh, I was down at the beach, Santa Monica, working at a bar and uh, drinking with the homeless and drinking with the other people that worked at the bars. And uh, my life got really small. I had been assaulted up in Hollywood one night. Um, my life started to get smaller. I could no longer feel safe because of my drinking and the positions uh, it put me in because of my willingness to go along with people if they were going to continue to buy me alcohol. I put myself in some dangerous positions. and um, So I had to quit doing that, and I stayed down towards the beach. And after the summer of 1992, down at the Santa Monica Pier, maybe Oscar, you remember, they, they used to have those free concerts on the pier every summer. And I'd make a lot of money during those times because I was giving booze away as long as you'd give me some cash and would always make a lot of money that time. And uh, at the end of the summer season down there, I uh, got in a car to go out to Palm Springs with my younger sister who was in town for the time. And we were going to go out there and work on our tans. <laughs> but we never quite made it to Palm Springs those last three days of my drinking because we had met a guy. There was this band really famous back then called Skid Row, and they had this, this video on MTV called 18 in Life, and the kid from that video, we were partying with him that weekend, and uh, we were drinking and carrying on and passing out in bathrooms and just, you know, up to no good, and after three days of that nonsense, I came to on the third day knowing that I was going to have to work that day, and the night before, I had woke up, um, I had come to because my sister thought the house was being broken into, she had narked on some of her dealers, and she thought they were coming to uh, have revenge on her. And so we called the cops, and they showed up and couldn't find anybody. We were hallucinating is what we were doing. <laughs> and then I finally passed out that night and came to on the morning of September 25th of 1992. And what happened for me is I absolutely reached the clarity and came, uh, had to face the truth about myself that day on September 25th of 1992. And the way that looked for me on that morning was this. Uh, I knew a couple of things to be absolutely true about me, and about 10.30 in the morning when I came to and I was terrified, I knew this. I knew that left to my own devices and without any type of assistance, there was no way I was not going to be able to take a drink that day, that I had absolutely no power to not take a drink of alcohol that day. It was beyond my ability to not ha to have that choice. I, had, I knew I didn't have a choice. The other thing I knew without failure is number two was that without some kind of intervention on my life that day, there was nothing I could do to quit living the life that I was living. And I think that that, le that drove the fear and terror in me even greater than the drinking, was that this was going to be the way that I was going to live for today and the next day and the next day because I had no ability to stop the trajectory of my life. And thank God that the clarity that that provided for me allowed me to call someone and ask for help. And I had never asked for help in those 12 years I was drinking with y'all when y'all were out there. Um, but it was lucky for me as a bartender, I knew someone that had gotten sober. She and I had been drinking buddies. She was kind of my best friend, and then she found y'all, and y'all took her from me. Um, her name was Trish, and she was beautiful. She, um, One of the reasons we were great friends, she used to drink at my bar, and then she started dating all my roommates because I lived with a couple of guys. <laughs> and she, she was friendly when she was drunk. She was also married at the same time. And, um, but what I loved about her is that, you know, she, she had gotten to a car accident when she was drinking. She went into detox and got sober. And she was a beautiful lady. She had been very successful as a model. She had lived in London. Her family was extremely successful and quite wealthy. They lived all over the world. And this guy that she was married to, they lived in a penthouse down at Santa Monica Beach in Ocean Park. And I wanted what she had, which was money, property, and prestige. Can't say it's ever left me, quite frankly. But at that time, she was now sober for three years. And she, you know, isn't the responsibility pledge? So she was the one that extended the hand of AA to me as a drinking drunk because she cared about me and she understood the situation I was in because she used to drink with me. She invite, invited me on a number of occasions to meet you guys. And she sold the package kind of like this. Oh, you should come in one of these AA meetings. Those people there are so funny. You wouldn't believe what these people do when they're drinking. You would laugh so hard. And I thought, well, that sounds kind of nice, but then when it came down to brass tacks, I could never show up. And I don't know about you when you were drinking, but I'd promise you the world as long as you'd be my friend, but I would flake on you at every opportunity. So I never really met y'all. But on that day, uh, I called her, and she answered the phone when I needed her most. And she talked to me about the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, and she suggested that I go to a meeting of AA. 
And I, uh, she said, I'm not going to be in town tomorrow night, but there's a meeting that maybe you can go to. And one of the guys that drank on my bar, he was a guitar player, and he was not a drunk. He was just a good person. And he offered to take me to that meeting. He was a normal-minded guy. I'm trying to remember his name. Mark was his name. Anyways, so my first meeting of Alcoholics Anonymous where I did not drink was uh, the Friday night um, Rodeo Drive meeting in Beverly Hills. And I, was, I went to that meeting, and there's a couple hundred people at that meeting, and I was absolutely terrified. It was at the corner of uh, Rodeo Drive and Santa Monica Boulevard, and it was a beautiful old Ro Romanesque church with a beautiful courtyard when you first walk into the property. And I walked into that courtyard, and there was a bunch of people having conversations, kind of like you y'all were doing outside before the meeting started. But see, people like that scared me because I was so afraid when I came to AA because I don't know how to have a conversation with you when I'm sober. Like, I just lock up. Like, and I thought, how am I going to talk to these people? I don't know how to talk to these people. So uh, I walked in, and to my left, there was these three men talking, and this attractive man turned around, and he was one of those guys. I know, And there's a couple of you here tonight. Greg's one of them. Okay. That, you're, you're one of them, too. No, you. Okay, okay. So here was this guy. Now, he was cute. And he, but he was wearing khaki pants with a crease down the center because he had had them pressed before he put them on. Oscar, too. And then he had, like, a collared shirt. Are those jeans? Okay. Collared shirt. He had a collared shirt on. He was a polo or a button-down shirt. And he had a sport coat on with brown leather patches on the elbows. Now, I knew that men like that don't hang around white trash like me. And I was really terrified of him. But um, he turned around and he said, hi, how are you doing? My name's whatever. You know, how, you know, how long have you been uh, sober? I said, today's my first day. He goes, well, welcome to Alcoholics Anonymous. And at that moment, I knew that guy wanted me so bad. <laughs> and nothing could be further from the truth. Thank God men have sponsors in AA. Y'all stayed away from me for a long time. You were so lucky. <laughs> But that was the mindset. I mean, I brought my tools for living as a drinking drunk into the rooms of Alcoholics Anonymous, and I was not prepared to let them go for a few years when I got here. And this is what that looked like. For the first couple of years of me coming to AA, I would come to you when it was convenient for my schedule. When I got in this, I went back to working on the Third Street Promenade. There was a pool bar down there. I worked on the pier for a little while. I'd get home at 4 a.m. I'd crawl out of bed at 1130. I might make the 12 p.m. Uh, meeting over at 26th and Broadway. There was a bunch of cute guys there, so I thought, why not? <laughs> and then um, I had someone, there was a guy there that befriended me, and he said, I should get a commitment. Why don't you be a greeter? I don't want, I, that means I have to talk to people. He goes, no, just say hello, and then let them take over. So, hi, I'm Allison. And you know, like, eventually they would say, oh, hi, how are you, Allison? It's good to see you again. It started to happen. There was like a conversation started to happen. I was mesmerized by that. But here's what happened, you guys. I was not here to work your steps. I was not here to practice your traditions. Boring. I was here looking for Mr. Next Cute Guy to take care of me, which is a tool I've always had in my toolbox. Who's the bigger personality, the big strong man that's going to take care of me? I'll do whatever you want. And uh, that did not go very well, and you stayed away. But what I found is myself in a level of despair and separation from the program of Alcoholics Anonymous because I wasn't doing what you were doing here. In my first two years of sobriety, because I was still living with a severely broken spirit and very little recovery, I had done not much more than just stay sober and go to some meetings. I, I, I got it. Well, I got a tattoo on my leg, no big deal. I got into body piercing, like, all over the place. And then I would go to meetings with a wife beater tied up in the back so you could see everything that was pierced. And I would, like, stand at the door, and I would daisy dukes and body-hugging men and, you know, just making sure you understood I was there. And the reason I tell you that is I'm the girl that goes to the meeting, and for some reason, I'm not going to get coffee five minutes before the meeting starts. I absolutely have to have it five minutes after the meeting starts because all of you are sitting, and you are a seated audience, so you can check me out as I go back to the coffee pot and take notice of what you could have if you'll only ask. And this is, but I was so desperate. I was so desperate for your... I know, I know without a shot. Hey. <laughs> I knew without a shadow of a doubt, to this day, my biggest fear in life is that I'm going to be irrelevant, that my life will not matter. And I don't think, 
I don't see that coming true because I'm a very active member of Alcoholics Anonymous. But I realize that that is something that has been true for me for many years is I don't think I matter. I don't think I'm relevant, and I have to get you to pay attention to me, and I'm willing to go to some extremes to make that happen. It was at that time that I met the man that changed my life. He was a member, a strong member of Alcoholics Anonymous. He had moved out from Iowa uh, the year before or so. Um, he sponsored both men and women. He was a, and what, I, what was attractive to me about this man is that he would come into the room and he'd walk down and he's kind of like Oscar. He would shake everybody's hand. He would say, hello, everybody. He would look for the newcomer. People would want him to share. He was a big personality and he seemed to have, he wore his sobriety very lightly. Um, he would make fun of himself and about the nature of alcoholism, which I knew very little about. And so I wanted what that man had, and I knew that there was something about the way he lived his life. I wasn't quite sure. But I also knew that because he was a man, I could also manipulate the heck out of him to get what I wanted, which is someone to take care of me and take responsibility for my life. And I asked that man to have coffee with me, and he said no. Uh, he said no at first, and then we ended up going to have coffee down in Marina Del Rey at Joni's Coffee Roasters. And they have these clear coffee mugs down there, and he drinks black coffee, and he he showed me, uh, he opened, picked up a cup and he said, can you see through the black part of this mug where my coffee is in the bottom of this coffee mug? And I said, no. He goes, well, you know, Allison, that's your sobriety right now. He says, on page 55 of the big book, it states that deep down inside every man, woman, and child is the fundamental idea of God, though we may be obscured by calamity, by pomp, and by worship of other things. He goes, and I think that's true for you. And I knew at that moment that that man knew what was wrong with me. And it, it, it gave me hope. Um, but it also terrified me that I felt like there was someone that really could, could understand my thinking and that he could probably read my mind. I, I, wanted, I wanted to know what he knew. I thought he could help me, but I was not going to ask him to sponsor me right away because I had a couple of Pantera tickets in my pocket. No way I'm missing that show. So I went out to Typo Negative, Typo Negative and Pantera out in San Bernardino. I took a newcomer. He got drunk. I didn't care. And then, um, but he was, <laughs> and uh, he was dating my coworker. <laughs> I didn't care. And uh, we went out to that show. It was a great show. I got back. I'm now working over at a Mexican restaurant by UCLA in Westwood. I got busted for serving a minor. It was like a week after that concert. I got busted for serving a minor at the bar. And um, I got sent home. I got fired on the spot. I was publicly humiliated. And the only person I knew to call at that time was that man that talked to me about my alcoholism. And I asked him for help, and he said, you know what? I'm going to be speaking out in Palm Springs this weekend. You know, some of the women I sponsor are going to be out there. You can, you can stay in the room with them. Why don't you could drive on out? And I said to him, did you not hear what I said? I lost my job. You expect me to get in my car? How am I supposed to get to Palm Springs? <coughs> Click. I called him back. I said, okay, where do you need me to go? This is I'm at this hotel. You need to figure out how to get there. Well, I had this old Jack Daniels jar with $50 worth of quarters in it. I put gas in my car. I went to Palm Springs, and there was those women he sponsored. And I realized it was those women. I hated those women. <laughs> you know the women that get commitments in AA meetings, and they, like, try to sponsor newcomer women, and they shake your hands. They, they're respectful. They stay away from men, or they're polite, and they shake their hands. They don't cuss from the podium like I like to. And I knew that if I was around those women, it was really going to amplify the fact that I was, n I was extremely unladylike. And I did not want to have to feel so much smaller than them because I was next to them. But what happened is those women absolutely changed my life. Um, they became my AA sisters. I asked that man to sponsor me after that, and he said this to me. He said, I'm willing to work with you. As, uh, are you willing to take my direction as long as, it's, there's not, as long as it's not illegal, indecent, or immoral? And I said, yes. And he goes, and are you willing to take direction without debate? And I said, yes. Never should have said that. <laughs> <laughs> I had one of those sponsors that if I asked why, he said, shut up and get another sponsor. Don't ask me why. He goes, you will, you will learn why in the experience, and you will have the knowing. Don't ever ask me why. And um, it took a long time for me to understand, and I attribute so much of my sobriety to the direction I took for that man at that time. Did I need it any differently? Did I need someone that was going to love me till I could love myself? I don't know. All I know is what I got and what I was open to at the time, and it worked very well for me. I grew to love and respect that man like I would my father, and he helped me tremendously. He, because of him, I fell in love with Alcoholics Anonymous. 
And it was at that time I also met Oscar in the home group that we were a part of, and Lexi too. Um, here was this great group of people, 800 to 1,000 people every week, and everybody was sponsored the same. There was a level of accountability and a commitment to making this group go off without a hitch. Um, and what I loved about that group is if, if there was a commitment that needed to be had because you needed a job to do, they would just make one up for you. Because some days you just need a reason to show up and having a commitment was so important early in my sobriety. But what I was is I was with the, in a wave of people that were living by the same principles, by the same level of commitment to respecting Alcoholics Anonymous, to respecting the podium by the way that we dressed, by the way that we used our language at the podium, the fact that we want to focus on the recovery from alcoholism, not the ANDA. I've got no use for the ANDA, although when I was new, I experienced uh, going to a several other ANDA groups. I just found out that I was an alcoholic that did those things. But I could not identify with that because I have alcoholism. And uh, I learned what it was like to work with other people. I did not want to work with other people in AA. You are inconvenient to me. And I did not want to sponsor for quite some time. And I was standing in line at my home group one night because you'd get there an hour before they would open the doors. And this girl walks up. She's all bubbly and stuff, and she's new. Oh, my God, it's a Pacific group. I can't wait. I need a sponsor. Do you know where I can get a sponsor? You know, you really should. I was about three or four years sober. I go, you know what? You really you need to get someone who's five years sober because they probably know what you're doing around here because that meant I was disqualified from doing the job, right? <laughs> Would you not believe I got into that meeting, and we're like, what is it, like 45 minutes of fellowship before the meeting starts? And my sponsor way over at the coffee pot. He's looking at me, and there she is, standing right next to him. He's like, Hey, Allison, I heard you met so-and-so. Did you tell her you wanted to sponsor her? Yes, sir. <laughs> I still remember that, and that was like 1996. Um, but I learned... Uh, Sponsorship came, I, I, I waited. I, I tried sponsoring a few people, but I was not sponsoring what I believed in. I was sponsoring what I thought I was supposed to do, and it didn't go very well. And now I sponsor several women. They are the love of my life, and I don't even, I think Maureen knows because she sponsors women too, and she has a lot of experience. You know how much I fall in love with the women I sponsor because we're so much alike. And um, so what happened? Being in that home group taught me how to learn respect for other people. I was taught when I came to that meeting, I always had to find my sponsor and shake their hand and say hello. I also found out that I should try to find the people with more time than myself. And if I was going to walk up to a group of people, and because I knew everybody in my home group, the person with the most time is the person whose hand I shake first. And I would go down the line, like there would be Clancy, and then there would be Johnny, and then there would be Frank, and then there would be my sponsor, or something like that. But I, I say that because I did not understand the level of self-esteem that grew in me as a result of the respect I showed for people who came before me that were trying to teach me how to stay sober. And I, I didn't know that was going to happen. I'm just so grateful for those little things you just don't expect. I experienced the first time, I experienced joy for the first time in Alcoholics Anonymous. I was standing back at the golfing table at my home group, realizing that I knew most of the people in that room, hundreds of people, that I always had a commitment there, that I always showed up and did what I said I was going to do because that's what you taught me to do. And I'm, I, am, I am just as lazy as the laziest person you're going to meet in LA, in AA. And I, I <laughs> LA, AA. Um, I, I have always been like the princess in the pea. I always want to be surrounded by bubble wrap, feather pillows, and puppy dog noses. And don't mess with my sleep hour. And don't tell, you know, I just, I'm, I don't want to be inconvenienced. But there's, there, I found no joy. I found emptiness, hollowness, pain, extreme self-centeredness, and self-obsession. And, and people were intolerant of me. And so I've, ha I've been asked to do things contrary to who I am as an alcoholic, to start learning the value of my life, the value of life and others, and this thing that's greater than me called Alcoholics Anonymous. Uh, in 1999, I met a man in AA. He was in my home group. I had not dated him four years. And uh, I, was get, I figured, well, he asked me out. He t asked me out for a few months, actually. And um, I decided it would be nice to get a meal bought for me. <laughs> and uh, I had to talk to my sponsor because I tend to go for um, – musicians that don't have a job. That's usually what I'm chasing. And uh, he said, no, this guy, you know, he's a naval officer. He's got a job in pharmaceuticals. Not that kind. 
he worked for Pfizer at the time, and, and I learned how to date. I was six years sober or so, and I learned how to date. I learned how to be appropriate. And, um, you know, that gentleman and I got married a year and a half later, and, and we started our life in AA. But this is where it gets to where I spent, you know, I, I, I left that sponsorship. I got a wonderful woman in my, in my home group named Karen Garrison as my sponsor. Um, but I started to drop off and, you know, a couple commitments here and there. I started to lie by omission. You know, I just didn't tell her everything that was going on. I realized it was time, time to get serious about my education. It was time to really start looking at how we were going to plan a family and make a house and get the right curtains for the curtain rods. And that became more important to me because, remember, you were all kind of inconvenient to begin with. <laughs> and that's what I started to do. And, and my, my ex-husband did the same thing. And he started to drop off, and things were, you know, it's no wonder that that mar marriage didn't survive. And I want to tell you something I learned about uh, being sober and inactive in AA and what I had to learn about the demise of that marriage. Um, I spent years blaming him for everything. And some things that I learned from my sponsor were this. It's not his fault. It's not his fault. And he can do whatever he wants. You, Allison get to wake up every day and make a decision if you're going to be in this relationship or not. He gets to make the same decision. And if you do not like the how he lives his decision, you, have the ch you can leave. But you can't ask him to change. How dare you? So here's what happened. My ex-husband took a deployment to uh, London in 2010 for 18 months. I later found out to get away from me. And he sent me a scathing letter a month later, right before the uh, San Antonio International, telling me that I was psychotic and mentally ill and I need to see a therapist, that he could no longer stay in this marriage if I did not change. <laughs> um, I took it to uh, my sponsor. I went to the International, and here's the direction I got. And it really was really great direction. He said, because uh, I went back to this sponsor later in my sobriety for a while, he said, Every time you have uh, any interaction with this guy, on the phone, through email, and you are disturbed, you will do a 10th step, right? Well, doesn't it say it in our literature? Every time we're disturbed, there's something wrong with us. And doesn't it also say in our 10th step in the big book that we need to grow in understanding and effectiveness? And so I did a 10th step every time I was disturbed, and here was the magic that happened to me. For the next, next 18 months of his deployment to London, he only came home twice, I got to understand how I contributed to the destruction of that marriage, how it was my unwillingness to practice the AA way of life in my marriage, and I was so selfish and aloof in that relationship that I drove that man crazy because he could not reach me because I refused to give myself to him in an emotional way. And he was frustrated and he was angry, but all I did was blame him for burst getting angry. But through the inventory process, I got to see the truth about myself. And the reason that is valuable is that I got to understand that when he came home the day before our 11th wedding anniversary, he took me to dinner on our wedding anniversary. We sat down and decided to get divorced. And it was rough going until we signed the papers two years later. It was a little, it was a little rough. But here's what I knew, is that man suffered as a result of being married to me, just like I didn't do very well being married to him. We were simply incompatible people. And what I needed to do was to reinvest my life into the program of alcohol. Alcoholics Anonymous and get busy, and that's exactly what I did. But as a result of doing that work, once we got divorced, we got to be the best of friends. We got to remain a united front for our children. And so when he died back in February, I had been his caregiver for the last three and a half years through his liver transplant, even though he continued drinking, through his esophageal varices and ending up in the ICU in San Diego, even through pancreatitis, even just you know, he died of multiple organ failure related to untreated alcoholism. And it was very ugly to watch and it was very painful. And uh, we got to stay as a united front to, to our children because you see, we had a child in 2003. But in 2005, um, in 2005, while he was in Kuwait on a deployment, I got a call from my family saying, your little sister, my little sister, was in the middle of her meth addiction. And she was back in Texas, and we were looking for her child. She had a second child. He was 10 months old. No one knew where he was. She had been spotted at a 7-Eleven uh, panhandling for money, and there was a baby seat in the back of the car, but no one saw the baby. And one of my mother's friends saw her, reported it to my mother. Three weeks later, my nephew, my 10-month nephew, was on the news in Houston, Texas, as a John Doe in foster care, and they were looking for his family. He had been left in a hotel room by the airport, in, at Hobby Airport in West uh, South Houston. 
She had, been, she had to do what she had to do to get what she needed, and she left him in the room to go get what she needed. And she, he was turned into the hotel staff, uh, by the housekeeping staff, and he went into foster care. And I wanted that child, and I got him uh, two and a half years later. Uh, he was in four foster homes before I was able to get custody of him. And he is my son today. He's 15 years old, and unfortunately, he's, he seems to be exhibiting a few symptoms that are much like me. I just, you know. <laughs> Please don't have the allergy, or I don't know. Do we want him to have the allergy so he can find us? But there's no guarantee. So, um, but I love my kids. They are my heart and soul. And, uh, you know, I love my life today. I moved out back to Arizona in 2012. Um, I've gotten to learn how to be a parent here. I've gotten to learn how to sponsor women. I've gotten to learn how to be a member of, my, my home group today is the Happy Valley group on Wednesday nights in North Phoenix, 7 p.m. on Wednesdays. We'd love to have you. And, um, I'm an active member of the program, and um, I learn so much from the people I sponsor and what they remind me about who, what I used to be like, and I, and I get reminded of how hard it is to do a 10th step and how hard it is to really be honest with myself. Uh, it took a lot for me to learn how to be really honest with myself. It was so painful to learn to be honest with myself, and, and, and I'm seeing that in the people I work with today and, and what tremendous gains we can make in learning to be happy, joyous, and free here. You know, I really believe that Alcoholics Anonymous promises us a couple of things, and that is victory over alcohol and freedom from the bondage of self. But there is a lot of things that we can do to be, do here. You know, when Karen sponsored me, I remember whining to her one more time about how inconvenient you all were. And um, she said, to, she was 30 years sober at the time. She was, Allison, Alcoholics Anonymous has been a GD inconvenience since the day I got here. And do y'all know who I'm talking about? Y'all knew Karen. And, uh, and I realized that. It's like the, my, my joy and my happiness is directly proportional to the level of surrender that I give you my life. And I have never, I have never been steered wrong as a result of giving up my time when I pick up the phone when the phone rings or if I get called to do something last minute and I get to go do something else. Now, I am not perfect. I still make mistakes, and that's one of the other gifts you have given me is the ability to know that I am wrong on any given day. But that, uh, that has allowed me to have a lot of faith in the power I have found as a result of the program of Alcoholics Anonymous, that I know I'll be okay even though I know I am flawed. And in turn, I get to know that you're a flawed human being, and that's okay too. I don't have to hold you up to a level of judgment like I used to have to. So on that note, I think I don't have my glasses on. I think I'm getting close to the end. But um, I want to thank you for staying awake tonight. I want to thank you for letting us come up to your cooler weather and for, and for joining me in the fellowship of this program. I, I wish you all the very best, and thanks for having me here. Um, Let's thank Allison once again. Outstanding.